Thank you all for being here. Past Armand Spitz lecturers, please stand and be recognized. I would like to read part of, of Armand Spitz's letter. You may have heard me say many times that in my opinion the full potential of planetarium, and I use the word in its broadest possible connotation, has yet barely been scratched. It is my earnest hope that the people who are chosen to be the Armand Spitz lecturers will be selected because of the fact that they have creative imaginations in this field and the courage to visualize the achievement of ideals in a practical way by the use of the planetarium instrument. I've always dreamed of its use to help produce more and better astronomers, and I believe that this is now coming to pass. Perhaps I have dreamed equally long and earnestly about its being used as a catalyst to begin reactions which will help people to understand each other individually and collectively. So please, in your selection of speakers, choose those who are not ashamed to acknowledge that they have a dream. And let the point always be stressed that we as thinking beings occupy a unique vantage point in nature between the macrocosm and the microcosm, and that we have the intellectual capability of comprehending both. It is my pleasure to have this chance to tell you a little about our Spitz, Spitz lecturer, Gary Sampson. Gary is the Director Emeritus of the Gary E. Sampson Planetarium at Wauwatosa West High School in, Miss, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. While operating the planetarium, he taught high school astronomy and earth science for 38 years, probably longer than some of you have been alive. His astronomy students were involved in the development of Project STAR, which resulted in the publication of the first ever astronomy textbooks. He has presented Project STAR, I'm sorry, high school astronomy textbooks. He's presented Project STAR and SPICA workshops to elementary, middle school, and high school teachers. Gary was a teacher leader for astronomy exchanges with high school students in China in 1988 and in Australia in 1991. In 1993, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific honored Gary as the initial re recipient of the Brennan Award for Excellence in Teaching High School Astronomy. Gary has been a GLP member for 38 years. He's a past president of GLPA and was a member of GLPA's executive committee for 13 years. Gary co-chaired this conference twice. He also served in the International Planetarium Society. He may tell you about being a member of Team Glippa, a group of Glippa planetarians who do bicycle rides, including the annual UPAF Ride for the Arts in Milwaukee. He probably won't tell you about his time as centerfold. <laughs> it is my honor and privilege to bring you Gary Sampson. <laughs> I was the centerfold of astronomy, but I was just close to the middle of the magazine, and I was fully clothed. <laughs> OK. Nice to see everybody here tonight. And this is truly an honor, so let's start. The call. The call came in on a chilly April afternoon. It was Gary T, better known as Gary Tomlin. Now, if you know Gary, he usually communicates with very long emails. They're very long. 
And his responses require very long emails. Very, very long. So my first thought was, what the heck is Gary up to now? Well then, his first uh, question was quite short and to the point. He said, are you going to Glipper this fall? And I said, well, yes. He said, um, how would you like to give a talk? I said, well, I've given talks before. I've done workshops. Um, sure. Uh, well, then uh, he said, uh, how would you like to do the Spitz lecture? And without thinking, I said, yes, I would be honored. But then, then reality struck. <laughs> it was a good thing I was sitting down at the time. To do the Spitz lecture is truly a tremendous honor, and I hope that I'm up to the task tonight. First, though, a shout out to Gary Tomlinson. One of the main reasons that Glipper conferences are so successful is because of the diligent work that Gary does behind the scenes. Really. So let's give it up for Gary. <laughs> Also, a uh, sincere thanks to the Glipa Executive Committee for selecting me for this year's Spitz Lecture. Tonight, I'd like to talk about three dreams. First dream, the origin of Glipa. Last year, Glipa celebrated our 50th anniversary conference. And it's quite fitting that we are here at the Longway Planetarium for this year's conference. Indeed, it was here at the Longway Planetarium in 1963 that Von Del Chamberlain, Dennis Sunnell, and David De Bruyne first met with the idea of forming an organization to further the quality education of all planetariums. And I understand from talking to Dave Bryan tonight that this is the first Lipa conference at Longway Planetarium. Now Webster's Dictionary describes a dream, one of the dreams, descriptions is a strongly desired goal or purpose. In my opinion, the idea, the idea of forming an organization to further the quality education of all planetariums, that idea started as a dream. And that dream has propelled our organization to what Glipa is in 2016. Following that initial meeting in 1963, a steering committee for the proposed organization was formed at Avon Planetarium in 1964, and in 1965, the first Glipa conference was held in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And here we have that image of the first Glipa conference. Here we are, 53 years after that initial meeting, a healthy, robust organization with great potential for continuing the dream, the idea, and the vision of our founding fathers. To that end, and with his permission, I would like to quote these prophetic words from Von Del Chamberlain's message at last year's conference. And this is with his permission. As far as I can tell, the fundamental purpose of our association has not changed and I hope it never does. We were brought into existence in order to communicate about, about our problems, solutions, and methods of providing ever-improved astronomy education for people of all ages, every walk of life, family and individual, general public and school, everyone. And to further that, these are, here are two words. And here are just some of the resources that we provided. The original dream of providing ever-improved astronomy education for all is indeed still alive. Over these many years, our organization has provided incredible resources for our members and for others far beyond our boundaries. Just consider these resources that are now available. The script bank with more than 300 scripts. The image bank with more than 1,000 images, 15 Glipa show kits, six Glipa videos, extensive resource materials that include curriculum guides, lesson plans and activities, papers on topical subjects, and many more. 
21 TIPS booklets, including such topics as Tips for the New Planetarium, Great Teaching Tips in the Planetarium, and Hints for Keeping Your Planetarium Open. Essential Astronomy Concepts for a K-12 Curriculum, a document approved by our regional planetarium associations. Currently, there's a committee working on a document that will relate national and state science standards to planetarium visits. A survey done by this committee indicates that a majority of teachers must show alignment with the curriculum and with the standards in order to get approval to go to the planetarium. It is significant to note that virtually all the GLIPA resources are available online and most are free to our members. In fact, the Hints for Keeping Your Planetarium Open Tips booklet is available free to all planetarians as an evidence of GLIPA's ongoing efforts to encourage vitality for all planetarians. It is also significant to note that literally hundreds of hours have been spent in converting the original documents from analog into an updated digital format. Also, considerable efforts have been gone into creating an updated GLIPA website as well, as I'm sure you realized when you registered this year. Publications. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the publication of the GLIPA newsletter. To date, 194 issues have been published. This also marks the 31st year of publication of our conference proceedings as solid evidence of the professionalism of our organization. Leadership. Up to the uh, left, of course, is the image of Vondell Chamberlain, actually from last year. Next to him is David DeBrine, one of our founding fathers also, and of course, what on the end is that ever-present Gary Tomlinson. <clears throat> uh, wow. Okay, speaking of leadership, for more than five decades, GLIPA has been blessed with the great leadership of the presidents, the elected officers, and the hardworking executive committee members. GLIPA has a reputation of getting things done, and there has been an effort to add a new verb to our vocabulary. If you want to get something done, you glippa it. <laughs> our leadership has extended far beyond our boundaries, and during my term as president, we initiated the Galileo Award, which is GLIPA's highest honor that recognizes persons of exemplary leadership at the national and or international level. Okay, okay, I know I need to list names of those who put forth tremendous efforts to make GLIPA the organization that it is. Truth is that this list is virtually endless and it will continue to grow. I am especially pleased to note the newer executive committee members have stepped forth to continue our legacy as outlined by Rondell Chamberlain last year. Secondly, my story. I grew up on Wisconsin dairy farm in the 1950s. We had a small herd of Holstein cattle. One of the highlights of my early years was to show cattle at our county fair. Now, as you look at the image, I'm the one on the right up there. <laughs> <laughs> one year, uh, my prize-winning heifer went out to the Wisconsin State Fair and then on to the Mid-South Fair in Memphis, Tennessee. In those days, Communication was very simple. We had one of those old-fashioned pregnant telephones, party line, and the mail was delivered by RFD, Rural Free Delivery. Didn't have television until I was in fifth grade, and it was a black and white set with a 12-inch screen, and we only got three, three channels, and that was on a good day. Our workload was endless, and there were many financial struggles. We were literally dirt poor farmers. But we had one thing that was priceless. We had clear, dark skies. I was fascinated by the night sky, and my seventh grade teacher, Mrs. Johnson, recognized this interest. 
he presented me with The Stars by H.A. Ray. And I was on the way to a life of studying the night sky. Ray's drawings of the constellations were quite realistic, and there was much more in his book to teach me more about astronomy. Night after night, I would go out to study the sky, and I spent many hours learning those constellations. I will never forget the satisfaction that I had when I was able to trace Ophiuchus on one of those summer nights. And off to the right is H.A. Ray's drawing of Ophiuchus. I never found the snakes, though. <laughs> Fast forward to 1970. Now, I was a new science teacher at the beautiful new Wauwatosa West High School. In those days, it was a state-of-the-art facility with an added plus that it had a planetarium. My first teaching assignments were in biology and environmental education, but I continued to wander into the planetarium just to see those stars again. I would find as many opportunities as possible to take my classes to the planetarium. And finally, I was given a one-fifth position to teach in the planetarium. Eventually, the position was increased to two-fifths. In the summer of 1975, I attended the Spitz Summer Institute and learned a lot from George Reed and Howard Schreiber, among others. But those early days were not easy. The planetarium was viewed as a sort of a status thing, and not much thought was given as to how to use those marvelous facilities. Administration was rather reluctant to devote time for field trips to this newfangled facility. My first GLIPA conference was at Cranbrook in 1978. Immediately, I realized the great potential of GLIPA in helping me to set up a planetarium curriculum in the Wauwatosa School District. One of the great helps in those days was Jean Bishop's paper on the educational value of the planetarium. I highly recommend Jean's paper. It's still relevant, even though it was originally typed. <laughs> I eventually set up a planetarium curriculum for the elementary and middle school students. These were the early, heady days of the space program, and the earth sciences were emerging with their importance for curriculum development. And teaching in the planetarium was fun. Our, yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Our Spitz A4 projector became Mr. Spitz. If the students clapped for him, he bowed. <laughs> All I had to do was lower the latitude control. <laughs> Technology was quite basic. There were several slide projectors, some special effects projectors, and the stereo sound system. We had a phonograph on the console and a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck in a drawer. Each year, I presented programs to about 7,000 elementary and middle school students. <laughs> Our planetarium became quite popular with those age groups. The image on the left up there is uh, a first grade class with Mr. Spitz in the background. Down to the lower right, um, I'm showing the moon rocks to a group of uh, kindergarten students. And above that is one of those letters you get when you go to the planetarium. One that I don't have here, but um, I wish I had saved. It said, Dear Mr. Sampson, next to my father, you're my favorite person. And I like your equipment, too. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> and kids say the darndest things. One day, I was teaching the, the winter sky in the planetarium. I showed an image of Taurus the bull. I asked the students what they were seeing. One eager young boy shouted out, it's the Chicago bull. <laughs> for 20 summers, I taught astronomy for college for kids at the University of Wisconsin's Milwaukee's Manfred Olson Planetarium. One day, I was pointing out the three stars of the summer triangle. One boy, we'll call him Joey, said he knew the names of those three stars. Vega, Denon, and Altair. I complimented him for knowing those names and asked him how he learned them. He mentioned he learned them from
from listening to tapes of the night sky. These were a series of tapes put out by the Astronomical Society of the Pacific at that time. Then I asked Joey, well, where did you get those tapes of the night sky? And he said, the Easter Bunny brought them. <laughs> Working with young students from kindergarten through eighth grade was very rewarding. Indeed, there is much to, to say about the joy of teaching young children in the planetarium. The students are always excited for a chance to learn in a new special environment. And to me, there is no happier sound in the world than the laughter of young children, especially in a planetarium setting. But I knew there was more. The true potential of the planetarium was still untapped. My dream, why not use our planetarium to develop an astronomy course for the high school level? The high school administration encouraged the development of this new course. Also, during that time, our school district was revamping our science curriculum. We realized that we were doing a great job for the college-bound students, but what about the rest of the student body? Thus, my goal in developing this new course was to open it to a wide range of student abilities. The planetarium provided a very graphic way to introduce new concepts. You start with elementary students with east, west, north, south, but if you extend those cardinal points, you could now teach the horizon system with azimuth and altitude. By extending Earth's north and south pole, I could teach the celestial sphere. By extending Earth-based longitude and latitude, I could teach right ascension and declination. The geocentric Earth projector was a great help in teaching time zones. With the beautiful Spitz star field, we could go into greater depth with learning constellations, stars, and deep space objects. The high school astronomy course became quite popular, as well as the elementary and middle school programs. Then, then there was the Harvard connection. The building there is the original Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, just commonly known as the Center for Astrophysics. In late 1986, I received a postcard from the Center for Astrophysics, and it was a request to provide a letter of support for a proposed new high school astronomy curriculum called Project STAR. As you can see, Project STAR stood for science teaching through its astronomical roots. I gladly wrote the support letter, and within a few months, I received word that a multi-million dollar grant was approved by the National Science Foundation, plus an inv invitation to be part of the Project STAR development team. I spent several summers working with the development team at the Center for Astrophysics. We had an amazing working relationship with the project leader, Philip Sadler, as well as many of the Center for Astrophysics astronomers. By the way, Phil was very proud to show us his new invention, Star Lab Portable Planetarium. There were four years of field testing with the new Project Star materials. My high school astronomy students worked diligently with these new hands-on activities. So um, first we see uh, some of my students uh, studying the phases of the moon. This is a Project Star activity. The image to the left there, uh, one of my students is working with the Project Star spectrometer. And down to the right, a uh, student is arranging the phases of the moon in order, without knowing it ahead of time, is a prediction for the moon phase activity. And here, <clears throat> this is a student constructing that moon phase dial. And uh, this moon phase dial would tell the time when a given phase of the moon rose, when it set, and when it was highest to the south. My students constructed celestial sphere globes and three-dimensional constellation models. <clears throat> we did scale models of the solar system. There were times when the entire astronomy course was taken up with testing Project Star activities. All told, 21 hands-on activities were developed and they became an integral part of the Project Star textbook 
the first ever high school astronomy textbook. <clears throat> the student to the left here is working on the Brighton's distance rule, and up to the right is the cover of the second edition of Project Star. <clears throat> as part of my work as a field test teacher, I send quarterly journals with feedback to the Center for Astrophysics. <coughs> you have to remember, this was the day before the internet. So the journals were sent on a floppy disk via US mail. Word processing was done on an Apple SE computer. And to think the operating system was on a floppy disk. It was a nine inch black and white screen. And uh, it was a rather basic computer in, the, in those days. The science team at the Center for Astrophysics really valued my feedback. And among other things, I was recommended as a teacher leader for the first ever science exchange between American and Chinese high school students. In the summer of 1988, two other teachers and I spent three weeks in Hong Kong and China with a group of 30 high school students. Astronomy was our special area of interest, and there were nine other groups of students in other areas of science. Our entire group met together with the Chinese high school students at an opening reception in Beijing at the Great Hall of the People in Tiananmen Square. From there, we visited astronomical sites in eastern China with a special interest at the Purple Mountain Observatory in Nanjing. So uh, again, to the left here is the ancient Beijing Observatory. If you look carefully on the roof of that building, there were ancient instruments. Just one example is off to the right there. It was a sextant that was developed in the 1600s. And here, uh, we see the Purple Mountain Observatory in Nanjing. And down to the right below, it was a 2.1 meter uh, reflecting telescope that was under construction at an astronomical instrument factory. Project Spica provided another special opportunity beginning in 1989. The summer workshop served as a preparation for presenting astronomy workshops for teachers. All told, I presented 20 Project Sp Spica astronomy workshops to 411 elementary, middle school, and senior high school teachers locally, regionally, and nationally. 1991 found me again as a teacher leader, this time to Australia, New Zealand, and with a return trip to Hawaii to observe the solar eclipse on July 11th. Truly a once in a lifetime trip. And here uh, we see uh, the American and the Australian students who are at the University of Wollongong. And if you look closely, they are constructing the Project Star Celestial Sphere Globes. We had one concern with the Southern Hemisphere people. They wanted to put south at the top of their globes. <laughs> but we insisted north is the correct orientation. <laughs> While in Australia, we visited astronomical sites, including the Australian Observatory and the Parkes Radio Telescope. The building, of course, to the left there is the exterior of the Australian Observatory. And to the right is a 3.9 meter reflector, which at that time, that was the largest telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. 64 meter Parkes Radio Telescope has been a real workhorse. And uh, speaking of workhorses, uh, down to the lower right, uh, they actually let me sit at the console. I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> By the way, the Parkes Radio Telescope is very historically important. It was at this site where the images first came down from the moon as Neil Armstrong stepped off the lunar lander. This was it. We looked forward with great anticipation to the eclipse in Hawaii. On that day, most of the Big Island was occluded, but we were able to observe about two minutes of totality from the slopes of Mauna Loa. We had a native bus driver who actually realized that if we went up on Mauna Loa, we'd have better chance for clear skies. The students had an opportunity to give their reaction to the eclipses on cassette tape recorders. But 
When we listened back to the tapes, all we heard was screaming. <laughs> Those kids really got excited. Overall, the trips to China, to Australia, to observe a solar eclipse, these trips provide a most unique experience for all of those students who were involved. 1993, I became the initial recipient of the Thomas Brennan Award given by the Astronomical Society of the Pacific for excellence in teaching high school astronomy. The image you see is a cross stitch that was done by Cindy Brennan, the daughter-in-law of the late Thomas Brennan. And it was a very special award. More opportunities came in 1996. In July of that year, I presented a high school astronomy course for a wide range of student abilities at the International Astronomical Union Educational Colloquium in London, UK. And uh, the left image, of course, is the cover of the book that was published from that colloquium. And down to the right is the first page of my manuscript. While in London, I also took a chance or an uh, opportunity to venture out to the Royal Greenwich Observatory, mainly to observe the prime meridian. And in November of that same year, I was selected as a consultant to the planetariums in Ecuador. While in Ecuador, our group visited the site where the original measurement was done for the equator. Thus, within four months, I observed both the prime meridian and the equator, and this in turn allowed me to provide a first-hand explanation of those basic <coughs> Earth-based coordinates for my students. Again, the image on the left is the original site where the prime meridian was first measured, and off to the right, I'm really not holding up that monument, to, but uh, that was a monument that was constructed at the very site where the equator was first uh, measured. The 1990s seemed to pass quite quickly. By 2001, it was time for retirement. In August of 2001, I received a phone call from the communications director of the Wauwatosa School District. She informed me that the school board would be naming the planetarium at Wauwatosa West High School after me. My reaction? Do I have to give a lot of money? Or do I have to be dead? I said, I wasn't ready to do either. <laughs> Needless to say, this was one of the greatest honors of my life. And here you see the original uh, 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 image of our uh, dedication, uh, Gary E. Sampson Planetarium. That lovely woman next to me is my wife, Joan. Joan and I have been married for 48 years. She's a lovely woman. She's watching on stream and video, too. Thank you. <laughs> OK. What happened after that? Let's find out. After retirement, I taught astronomy part-time at Wauwatosa East High School uh, for another five years. During that time, my astronomy students did extensive field testing for the Investigating Astronomy High School Initiative. Also. I spent several years as a member of the development team for investigating astronomy, and that has become the second high school astronomy textbook. Also during my time at Wauwatosa East, my students were involved with P.L. Ribsey, and they did research on Novi in the Andromeda Galaxy. So the upper uh, left picture there is the cover of the uh, new, really new, uh, investigating astronomy textbook. And down to the right, one of my students is working on the Novi in the, uh, from the Andromeda Galaxy. We got the raw data at Hip Peak and then brought them back to our schools. It was just three years ago that I finally decided to retire from teaching. Looking back, it was a great run, and this skinny farm boy from Wisconsin enjoyed a terrific career. Third dream. Entering space. Up to this point, I have discussed two dreams. The first was the dream that became the idea that formed Glipa. The second was my dream of developing a high school astronomy course for a wide range of student abilities. 
In reality, these first two dreams involve relatively small populations. On a broader scope, the dream of entering space has enticed virtually all of humankind. This is how author Norman Cousins described entering space. To be able to rise from the earth, to be able from a station in outer space, to see the relationship of the planet Earth to other planets, to be able to contemplate the billions of factors in precise and beautiful combination that make human existence possible, to be able to dwell on an encounter of the human brain and spirit with the universe. All of this enlarges the human horizon. People have dreamed of rising from the solid earth into the unknown for as long as they have inhabited this planet. Yet, less than 200 years passed between the day in June of 1783, when two Frenchmen first rose above a field outside Paris in a linen and paper balloon, and the day in 1961, when Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human to orbit the Earth. So here we see the Montgolfier brothers, uh, first supposedly to rise above the Earth, and they were in a linen and paper balloon. And of course, this is Yuri Gagarin in uh, April of 1961. Here in the United States, think about it, only 58 years elapsed between the first controlled flight of a winged aircraft at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and the suborbital flight of American astronaut Alan Shepard in 1961. So here's the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, 1903. 58 years later, here's uh, Alan Shepard in his Freedom 7 capsule, ready for launch. It's also well to remember that next year, 2017 will mark the 60th anniversary of the launch of Sputnik 1, of course, the event that supposedly initiated the space age. And here's Sputnik 1. In these six decades, we have faced enormous, enormous challenges to fill the dream of entering space. In fact, only 60 years ago, we did not know whether we could build a spacecraft that could survive re-entry into our atmosphere. We did not know whether humans could endure the physical effects of weightlessness or the psychological effects of separation from the Earth. We could not even be absolutely sure whether the moon was made of green cheese. <laughs> the possibility of landing astronauts on the moon seemed like distant and naive dreams. According to astronaut Joseph Allen, the Apollo missions to the moon, our first journeys of people from this world to another, were perhaps the most important event in human history. Who of us who were alive on July 20th, 1969, will ever forget the image of Neil Armstrong stepping onto the moon and uttering those immortal words that is one small step for a man and one giant leap for mankind. It was as if all of humanity was bound together by that one historic, incredible event. Best estimates are that 600 million people witnessed the event, either on television or radio. The Apollo 11 moon landing was the largest audience ever for a single event, and it represented an amazing one-fifth of the world's population at that time. For Armstrong, it was a mixed blessing. He was assured of fame in the history books, but he seemed uncomfortable with his notoriety. After a few years, he took a position as professor of aerospace engineering at the University of Cincinnati. He even bought a farm and started to grow corn and raise cattle. He did not give many interviews and rarely talked of his experience. Neil Alden Armstrong died on August 25, 2012, from complications of vascular bypass surgery. In a statement released by the White House, Armstrong was remembered as among the greatest of American heroes, not just of his time, but of all time. 
But let us not forget, Neil Armstrong was joined by lunar lander pilot Buzz Aldrin on that first lunar landing. This iconic image, of course, was actually Aldrin's footstep on the moon. Buzz Aldrin, at age 86, is very much alive and a strong international advocate of space science and planetary exploration. Of course, Aldrin is best known for being the second person to step on the moon. Far beyond that, though, he was a great innovator. In many ways, his career parallels that of Glippa. He received a doctorate of science in astronautics from MIT in 1963, the same year that that Glippa idea began here at Longway Planetarium. His thesis was line of sight guidance techniques for manned orbital rendezvous. Because of ex his experience with rendezvous of aircraft, Aldrin made major contributions to the Gemini space program. As a pilot of Gemini 12, he proved various methods for extravehicular activity. On that flight, he set a record for EVAs, demonstrating that astronauts could work outside spacecraft. Aldrin is passionate about his patriotism for the United States. He is concerned that China has copied the older Russian space technology and has far surpassed it. He has a strong opinion that, regardless of what the Russians or Chinese do, America needs a revival of that sort of emphasis today, developing our technology and placing a big goal in front of our country, especially for our youth, a goal large enough to inspire our nation to pursue excellence and greatness rather than mediocrity. Accordingly, Aldrin is a very strong advocate for sending humans to Mars. This is one of his recent books, uh, Mission to Mars, and down below there's Buzz Aldrin autographing one of his books at age 86. Buzz Aldrin has a lot to say about dreams also. His most recent book is No Dream is Too High, Life Lessons from a Man Who Walked on the Moon. Aldrin states that many people have a fire burning within them, something they feel compelled to do, or an idea or a project they strongly feel they should develop. Yet, too often, they push those dreams into a subconscious drawer and never really give them a chance to be fulfilled. Frequently, the reason we allow our dreams and desires to be tamped into a dark black hole is because somebody rejected us or said no to us. His solution to this problem? He goes on to say that much more than talent or a pleasant personality, perseverance and persistence will open doors for you if you simply keep working toward your goal and refuse to give up. In his letter to Von Del Chamberlain, Armand Spitz suggested that the Spit lecture would involve persons who are not afraid to acknowledge that they have a dream. My rather modest dream was to develop a high school astronomy course for a wide range of student abilities. Fortunately, I had the support of my high school administration and a real passion for teaching astronomy. So now, I challenge you. What are your dreams, your ideas? You have a vision, a special goal, or a project in mind. Are you an innovator? In his book, Aldrin states that innovators are dreamers, and I am one of them. So I know that innovators rarely are merely content to dream. They won't stop there, especially if they receive some encouragement. They will become doers. They will make things happen. Innovators are doers. They will make things happen. Doesn't this sound familiar? If you want to get something done, you Flip it. Let's say it together. If you want to get something done, you flip it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Finally, let us not be just dreamers. Let us be doers. Aldrin insists that the sky is not the limit. When you believe that all things are possible and you are willing to work hard to accomplish your goals, you can achieve, you can achieve the next impossible dream. No dream is too high. 
Thank you. service and contributions to the planetary profession and science education, uh, given with grateful appreciation uh, by the Great Lakes Planetary Association. Thank you. Thank you.